something fun. These two are pretty fucking gold. So let's start with this one. Games journalists are attacking Elden Ring. It shouldn't be popular. Dreamcast guy needs some help with his titles, bro. He could probably get a lot more views if he had somebody like actually um create his titles for him. They're not clickbaity enough. But eh, it's whatever. There have been three separate articles published today by different journalists actually attacking Elden Ring, claiming that it's some sort of misguided success or implying that it doesn't deserve the hype it's obtained, which to me... Isn't that what the fucking Horizon Forbidden West developers were saying? That Elden Ring was a bad game by comparison to theirs? Because it didn't fucking tell you exactly what to do at every waking second? is completely outlandish and i want to talk about this because it is something that is just so stupid that i have to laugh at the cringe or i'm going to go crazy what's up gamers dreamcast guy here now before we actually look at these ridiculously stupid mainstream media takes these are not obscure random websites this is stupid please like this video and subscribe if you haven't already now let's start things off by taking a look at the New York Times. Yes, indeed, the famous website of all websites. This is Tech Fix. In Elden Ring, the struggle feels real. Well, I'm glad to see that the New York Times is still full of shit like it's always been, so... Guess we shouldn't really be surprised. Real. The game evokes the hardships and disappointment of the world today, but also the hope of the human communication. That says communion, but okay. Okay, so this entire thing is ridiculous, talking about how the world is in a very bad spot, how media is trying to approach the fact that things have changed. The way we talk to each other, the way we interact, the way we even go into public has shifted. The way I go into public has not shifted. Sorry, I'm not a massive fucking, like, paranoid schizo who's actually thinking that people are going to drop dead on the street. But this guy basically says that in the beginning of this this uh, lockdowns and stuff, many of us were doing things like cooking bad bread and playing Animal Crossing. Now, we're all playing Elden Ring, a ruthlessly difficult game that only gets harder the more you play it. It about sums up what it's like to live in lockdown. What? What type of fucking retarded at... Dude, maybe I should make a video on this fucking article. Jesus Christ, this shit's absolutely, like, just ignorant. Elden Ring is a story that has something to do with the ring, but more important is its design. It's an open-world game where you can do whatever you want, whenever you want. Players will ride a horse through a poison swamp, sprint across molten lava, and traverse a crumbling bridge surrounded by tornadoes, fighting or evading enemies along the way. Now... Just like you have to avoid people in real life who aren't wearing a mask. <laughs> Pandemic humor. The biggest problem with this article is the fact that I do think it's eloquently written, but he claims that the only reason... Eloquently written? This is like some fucking middle school hack job article. ...that anybody is at all even paying attention to Elden Ring is because... There is stuff in the air. The Rona. Now, straight up, here's another thing that people are seriously laughing at. COVID is not airborne, dipshit. There are no actual screenshots inside of this article. The journalist took a freaking camera phone and photographed his screen. The gameplay is his actual phone recording the screen. This is... So... Is not a joke. This man is probably paid quite handsomely to film his screen. He. Who the fuck cares? This is the biggest issue you have with the article? Oh my god, bruh. Could not get a capture card. He couldn't get official screenshots. Now, let me explain something here. When you actually ask a publisher if you're going to like be talking about one of their games, if you're asking them for an official statement, they will give you screenshots if you don't have them. Like, if I'm trying to talk... Who fucking cares, bro? About, like, a, a couple months ago, I did a video talking about Rainbow Six, 
uh, Ubisoft gave me screenshots. So if I wanted to show something specifically, I could just pull up official freaking stuff from the game, from the people who made it. And yet this guy decided to go the cheapest route possible and film his screen. Now, wait, it's about to get worse. I want to show you a specific line. He basically says that the only reason you would play this game it's difficult, it's crazy, it's punishing, but the whole point of playing it is that you can't go anywhere else. Let me show you this ridic- What? Yeah, you can't go anywhere else. That's why there's like literal tens of thousands of video games you can play. Look at this line. Oh my god. At some point you face a dragon. You must fight or you must flee. You'll probably retreat and eventually, after acquiring enough strength, you'll be able to come back and face it down. Moments later- Yo, is that an analogy for getting your booster shots? Though you'll be ambushed and killed by something nasty. It's difficult to imagine this game outside of the lockdown era. Because now the world is starting to reopen. To many Americans, the dragon has been slain. And yet in other... Yup. What a shock. other parts of the world, a new variant of this is driving another wave. And in New York, cases are beginning to climb. Yeah, that's because the fucking Ukraine war shit is no longer pulling in people's attention. So the media has to go back to fear mongering. Big shock. And the New York Times is one of the guiltiest motherfuckers of that in this entire whole two year fucking event. DJ Aftershock of the Two isn't SEAL Team 6 located in Virginia Beach, though? I have no idea. Maybe. I know there's like a big uh, Navy presence there, but no clue. He's literally saying the only reason that people are even seemingly interested in this game or basically saying that that, that there's no point in playing it. It is baffling that you would try and connect these two extremely spread out dots of. Is it really baffling, though? It's the New York Times, bro. They're not exactly known for being intelligent. The thing we're dealing with in the real world versus this video game that is incredibly polished. But let me move on. This this entire article is absolute garbage. No offense to this gentleman. You were probably paid. You know what? Get that bread. But my God. Next. No, there is offense to that dude. He's a fucking brainlet. And he works for a brainlet company. Up This incredible gem. Why the hell is Elden Ring so popular? Commentary. It makes no sense. This guy. Yo, what the fuck? There's multiple of these? guy straight up makes an entire huge article yo so i'm thinking maybe i'll do one on that first one title the video elden ring gave me covid 19 <laughs> um that would be a pretty clickbait title uh what about this one next up what's the title this of this incredible- why the hell is elden ring so popular elden ring shouldn't be popular because i died or some bullshit like that who fucking knows bro or reviewer rage quits. Oh, fuck, I'm trying to think of a good title for this one. Hold up, maybe it'll come to me. Incredible Jim, why the hell is Elden Ring so popular? Commentary, it makes no sense. This guy straight up makes an entire huge article about how this game does not deserve its success. Nobody actually saw this success coming. For the last couple of months, I've been trying to figure out why. No one saw the game's success coming? Dude, it's literally been the most hyped video game for like the past year or two. Why everyone currently drawing breath is cursed earthly realm can't stop playing or even talking about Elden Ring. It's a mystery. It makes no sense. Elden Ring, a brutally challenging open world RPG, hasn't just been popular. The numbers have been astronomical. Popularity was to be expected. From Software released a number hit title, a number of hit titles. Dark Souls Bloodborne deserved each millions of players. But Elden Ring's level of success has put the famed developer into a whole new stratosphere. Basically what he keeps saying, this is one of the most popular games of all time. And you know what? You're not allowed to say that you saw this coming. This is literally everyone saw this fucking coming. The most annoying thing. I I, I hate when people, you know, journalists, YouTubers, random people. I hate when people seem to be upset that hype paid off. Don't say you predicted it. Don't you dare. With the benefits of hindsight, don't you smugly declare that anyone could have seen this coming. Literally no one could have predicted that Elden Ring could hit these giddy heights. It's my job to anticipate trends like these, and with Elden Ring... Well, maybe you should get a new fucking job, dumbass. Ring, I was a mile off. So, just because... Sounds like somebody should get fucking fired. You are an idiot 
doesn't mean the rest of us completely predicted this. Now, I had a chance to play in the Elden Ring tech test, and I said in my previous video... Oh, God, bro, nobody... You didn't need to play the tech test in order to know this game was going to be a success. Dark Souls has literally been getting more and more popular every single fucking time they released a game. Dark Souls 3 was a huge mainstream hit. Sekiro was an insanely big mainstream hit. Elden Ring literally was Dark Souls plus open world plus releasing in a time where there's no real AAA competition. It was literally set up to succeed. You didn't need to play a fucking tech demo to know it. Not to mention, it is probably the most hyped video game of the past three to four years. At least. Maybe even the past decade. Who fucking knows? But Elden Ring is one of the most hyped video games ever. Of course it was going to do well. You didn't need to play a fucking tech demo to know that shit. So DJ Aftershock of the Two heard about the... Wait. The New York Lieutenant Governor being arrested? Nah. I don't keep up to date with that state. And Eric C with the five top five Latin American Caribbean baddest chicks. Brazil, number one. Colombia, number two. Yeah, Colombia, close as fuck. Agreed. Uh, three, Dominican Republic. Agreed. I've been there multiple times. Four, Cuba. I don't know. They're commies, so maybe, maybe not. And five, Venezuela. Again, they're commies, so maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Went to Brazil in 2019. And I've seen the light. Hell yeah, bro. Hopefully you got to um, sample the local um, delicacies. And danger talking with the five. Maybe you would get a COVID context disclaimer from YouTube under your video. Can't think of a higher honor. I know, for real. I probably would. That is kind of a dub. And Oski Waski with the two bad takes from journalists plus content equals money. Amen, dude. 100%. Yeah, I'm a gamer! I'm seeing two fucking videos here. Videos that this game was going to be not only one of the best things ever, but extremely popular. People have even written articles. There's even screenshots of Gene Park saying, Look, I don't love being hyperbolic, but Elden Ring is really shaping up to be a dream come true. He wrote that in November 2021. Huh, what is that? Oh, months before the game came out. It's almost as if we could all understand why this game was going to be popular. Look, this guy again is trying to act like, oh, it's, it's, you know, people are stuck inside. They're going to play more games. No one is stuck inside anymore unless you're literally a fucking moron. Bro, if people are legitimately afraid to leave their fucking house at this point, like, I don't know what to tell you. Just stay there for the rest of your life because you're doing everybody else a favor. Just stay away from us at this point. Like, what the fuck are these people talking about? No one is locked inside of their house anymore. You can go do whatever the fuck you want, basically anywhere in the world at this point. My thing is that this guy still keeps trying to act like this is just some crazy, unfounded phenomenon. Let me just break this down for this particular dipshit. Everybody loves video games. Video games are becoming mainstream as heck. Everybody's got a console. People are playing stuff on the Nintendo Switch. I've been playing Nintendo Switch on the treadmill, playing RPGs and stuff and trying to get into shape. Everybody everywhere is playing games. Everybody has a console. Everybody has access to an Xbox or a PlayStation. Yo, that's actually really fucking smart. Damn. Plugging in a video game console to a fucking... Tr Yo, that's actually really a good idea. I would love to do that with Lego Star Wars, but I'm not hauling a fucking Xbox with the gym. Fuck that. <laughs> but that's actually pretty smart. Or a PC or a laptop. I mean, there are video games everywhere. If you don't think that there are millions and tens of millions of people who are going to buy a game that's this high on Metacritic, Elden Ring is an undoubted masterpiece. Everybody knows it's good. Everybody understands that it's good. Everybody's talking about how it's good. In fact, here's an interesting article I found that has a very negative title, but I feel like it actually brings up some great points. This is gamesindustry.biz, and what it discovered is the fact that basically everybody is buying Elden Ring because of word of mouth. This is a real stat right here. It's very fascinating. Friend recommendation. Over 200 gamers responded to the survey. Dude, 200 people is not representative of, like, 20 million people who have played this game. I hate when people act like these little fucking surveys actually represent anything. 
victims accounted for 40% of new Elden Ring customers, while 27% were drawn in. No, it accounted for eight, what, 80 new customers? That's a... By the authors and the creators, which means that straight up, everybody is screaming from the rooftops about how amazing Elden Ring is, very deservedly so. Oh, look, here's a screenshot from the publisher because it's not a crazy person taking pictures of a screen. But, yeah, didn't Elden Ring, like, set pre-order fucking records as well? So I don't think it's word of mouth that led to this game's insane success. I'm pretty sure, like, From Software's track record is the primary kind of booster of that. Because this is, like, one of the most pre-ordered video games in all of history, correct? I don't think I'm mistaken on that one. Like, I'm pretty sure it broke Steam pre-order records, right? Or something close to that. Saber Ram with the 10, rumors Armor Core 6 will play like or be heavily inspired by the Souls games. Armor Core 6 has been confirmed, but supposedly being inspired by Souls scares me. Go play Surge for Robot Souls. Well, I have no idea what Armored Core is. All I know, it's like FromSoft's like mech game, so I don't know what it plays like or anything, because honestly, I don't like mechs. I think it's like one of the corniest themes in video games. The only time I actually liked it was Titanfall 1. That was it. I think this really hammers home the fact that video games are growing. Video games are mainstream. You can't just print out these incredible... Is it better than COD Vanguard? Yeah, I'd say Elden Ring is definitely a better game than COD Vanguard. 100%. ...play cringe bad takes anymore and expect them to just go into the radar. You are making an ass out of yourself. And honestly, I feel like this is embarrassing your publication. The fact that this hasn't been taken down or retracted, like the fact, think of the amount of people that wrote this article. It was approved by a publisher. They put it up. Yeah, it was approved by the publishing board of the New York Times. I mean, you're literally talking about people that probably have a fucking like marble rolling around the inside of their hollowed out skull. Like these are not intelligent human beings. Up on this website, this is one of the biggest websites in the English speaking universe. No, it's not. And the New York Times is like on the verge of bankruptcy, if I'm not mistaken. It's garbage. Now, you know what? That's not the worst one of all. This is the worst one. Coindesk. This is a freaking website all about Bitcoin and Ethereum and all these. Hell yeah, dude. Fucking diamond hands for the win. Stupid freaking things. I don't I, I can't even believe I'm saying this, but Elden Ring has outlasted its critics and so will Bitcoin. This <laughs> Bruh. This guy is straight up trying to compare Elden Ring That's to... That's fucking funny as shit. ...freaking Bitcoin. He's trying to act like it will somehow just stay around forever, or... I don't know. Elden Ring is not just successful. It's unconventional gameplay. It's obscure. It's really, really cool. Just like Bitcoin. This is insane. Welcome to the most cringy of all op-eds. A labored comparison between the infinite complexity of reality and a piece of pop culture. In this... At least they're self-aware, bro. Welcome to the most cringy of all op-eds. You know, at least they're self-aware enough to point that shit out. New Generation with the 5 Gundam Evolution is awesome. The movement is insane. I think you'd enjoy it. I don't know, man. I'm just going to be on Like, the whole mech concept to me is just really fucking dumb. But maybe. I don't know. This case between cryptocurrency and Elden Ring. I am going to lose my mind. I am going to... Eat my copy of Elden Ring. This is an ab Do it. abomination. I cannot believe that these people are writing articles like this. Why? I mean, what's like wrong with the article? I'm, I'm actually kind of interested to read it now because it sounds kind of funny. Can't you just be normal? Like, just, just touch grass. Touch grace. Every single one of these takes are truly maidenless. I know I'm... Bruh. I'm a mega fan of Dark Souls. I'm a mega fan of Miyazaki. I'm probably too much of a From Software fanboy, but this is just astronomical amounts of cringe. Bro, they literally admit that in the first part of the fucking article. That's the whole point. I don't know, bro. I actually kind of want to read it now. Play a video game before you talk about it. Don't just get two shoe strings and tie them loosely together. I'm going to lose it. I'm going to absolutely lose my mind. I, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. I, I need to go 
lift some weights and freaking cleanse my soul. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please, I hope I did not damage your sanity with the worst takes I found today. Much love. Please, if you could, give this video a like. Subscribe if you haven't already. And please, find that article, keep bro. dreaming. Oh my god, this literally, I literally, I feel like I'm going to have a headache watching this. I'm, I, I'm, this is, I'm, I'm in shock. Thanks so much for watching that video. All right, let's see. I found it. So I'm ashamed to find myself mining such hoary tropes, but the parallels between crypto and the Souls games are hard to turn away from. The two epic projects even launched almost simultaneously with Bitcoin's Genesis block mined in January of 2009. And the first Souls game, Demon Souls, released in Japan in February of 2009. That's actually kind of funny. Shit, that is kind of a coincidence. Um, my main point, though, have to do, or my main points, though, have to do with the creative purity of vision, accessibility, and community. The Souls games like Crypto arrived and thrived over a period when the creative and ideological fucking bankruptcy of the competition was becoming too obvious to ignore. Bitcoin had the 2008 financial crisis and later rising anxiety about data harvesting by Web2 operations for as useful examples. Blah, blah, blah. The Souls games quietly stood athwart the trend towards hyper slick, user friendly, but lifeless AAA game. This, honestly, this is not bad. It's actually a pretty good comparison in all honesty. I don't know. I don't see that as like a super cringe take they're not making bad comparisons they're basically saying like both kind of said fuck it to what was normal and just kind of did what they wanted to do so I don't know I don't see that as like some super fucking cringy comparison it's just a good way to like clickbait the title Elden Ring and then stick Bitcoin in there as well for double the fucking clicks. I don't know. I don't really see an issue with that. So let's see. And Elden Ring's hyper success came only after a long and sometimes lonely process of building and experimenting made possible with the support of small dedicated fan base in the face of a horde of uncomprehending, dare I say, maidenless critics and these weren't people who simply disliked the games and weren't interested in playing them. They were people who regarded the existence of these games as a threat. Their strangeness was a personal affront, an attack on an entire status quo world. Yeah. I mean, it's not wrong. This is definitely somebody who's a fan of like Dark Souls writing this shit. I don't I think it's a pretty good comparison in all honesty. But yeah. I wouldn't say this is necessarily cringe. The fucking New York Times one is way fucking worse. Personally, but I don't know, man. I'm not a real gamer, so who am I to judge, right? Did anyone see 2042 finally dropping below a thousand play? Yo, really? Hold up, shit. I want to check this. Um, just so everybody sees, still haven't even fucking played it. Uh, community hub. Let's see how many people are on. A thousand ninety three. Shit, man. That's pretty. How many people are in Battlefield Four? Please have more. Yo. Oh wait, fuck. Did I click the same thing? Yo, why did it? Okay, there we go. Ah, it's got less. Damn it. I was hoping Battlefield 4 would have more people. Unlucky. Yeah, let's let's check Halo. <laughs> oh shit. So everybody's going to accuse me of going like, "Yeah, bro, shut the fuck up. Stop making fun of Halo." But yeah, let's see Destiny. How are they doing? 50,000? Pretty fucking well. Um, What's another game we can check? CSGO. Probably like, yeah. 405,000. 
what other games can we check? Let's see how many people are on Titanfall 1. I doubt anybody. Isn't the game, like, completely offline? Well, 48 in group chat. I don't know what the fuck that means. How many people are in New World? 16,000 people still. Damn. New World still holding on. What was that other game? Lost Ark? It just came out like two months ago. Let's see. Almost 300,000, bro. Jesus. Yeah, Lost Ark's doing pretty well. It's definitely having some longevity. I don't know, man. MCC? Oh, shit. Let me check. I think I have that up here. <laughs> that's weak there's 2,000 more people on fucking MCC than Halo Infinite <laughs> that's a fat fucking L bro but motherfuckers will still damage control for the fact that Halo Infinite's not dead Oh, God. That's terrible, dude. 2,000 more... Like, 50% more people are playing Halo the Master Chief Collection versus fucking Halo Infinite. God damn. Because MCC got updated? Bro, they're updating MCC and they're not even fucking updating Halo Infinite. Jesus Christ, man. Even 343 knows it's fucking over. Does Xbox <laughs> Fuck you. Jesus Christ, man. They're adding new content to MCC before fucking Halo Infinite. Game Pass hurts developers. Does play Halo MCC is on Xbox, bro. PlayStation Plus hurts developers. This Yeah, bro, MCC you paid for and Infinite's free. Exactly. One hundred percent. But motherfuckers will still say I'm just hating on the game blindly and I'm just like completely full of shit. Men lie, women lie, numbers don't lie. So you generation with the two MCC got a flood firefight mode? Why the fuck didn't they add that shit to Halo Infinite? Like why are they adding new modes to Halo MCC? Take that effort and put it into your game that's literally dying at this point. This idea of giving away games for free, day and date, is something that seems to be debated a lot. Because right now, we're still in the very early stages of these subscription services. The idea of paying a monthly fee to get access to tens if not hundreds of different games, it's still a very fresh concept. And now, we have the first developer who's come out and said that PlayStation Plus directly hurt his game. Now, I want to... Battlefield 1 reviewed better than Vanguard? Numbers don't lie? You actually believe review scores? Damn. That's kind of an L, bro. Review scores are a fad. Like, so, according to review scores, I The Last of Us 2 is one of the best video games of all time? Is that what you're telling me? That's a fact. This What's it, Gamers? Dreamcast guy here. Uh, super quickly, if you hear an owl hooting, there is a bird that must be on bird meth right outside my office, and, and I don't know what's happening. But we're going to be talking about Oddworld Soulstorm. Now, this is more about the grander concept of it and not this game specifically, but the guy who actually made the game is saying that it was devastating for the release to put it on PlayStation Plus. Now, well, no shit. Who the fuck's going to buy a game? If it's free on PlayStation Plus, duh. Part of the reason this is just so interesting to me is that Oddworld Soulstorm is an extremely good game. I have the game physically. I have the game digitally. I have beaten the heck out of it. It's extremely good. But they did that thing where they gave it away day and date. They said that originally they were expecting to sell about 50,000 to 100,000 copies of the game itself. Instead, on PlayStation Plus for free, it was downloaded over 4 million times. Yeah, because everyone's going to fucking download the free games. You just add them to your library, even if you don't want to play them. 
Now, I want to explore this from multiple directions. I want to talk about his state. This dude actually believed that his game was only going to be downloaded 50 to 100,000 times. Like, what the fuck? He goes, his studio Oddworld Inhabitants is expecting around 50,000 to 100,000 copies of Oddworld Soulstorm to be claimed during its time as a PS Plus free game. You actually think only 50,000 people out of the, what, 50,000 or 50 million people who are sub to PS Plus are going to download it? It's a free game. They're going to just add it to their library, bro. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? statements and then i want to look through other playstation plus games and i'm actually surprised it was only four million times to be honest some also some xbox game pass stuff because all of this to me this is a new generation of game development and it is going to end up affecting us as gamers basically what he's saying is this right now it's a double-edged sword i'll give you an example around soulstorm lanning said now this guy he's the director of the dude he's the creator of odd world he was very very passionate about this project he said this about playstation plus initially he felt that doing playstation plus was a necessity to get the project done we were hitting a number of legacy technical debt issues and talent issues and you know the games industry is emerging fast and huge companies are paying fortunes now let me translate this gamer speak a little bit here. Essentially what he's saying is that they were having trouble getting funding, they were having trouble keeping employees. Like a lot of times when you're making a game now, you need hundreds and hundreds of people to typically live in a physical location, work on the project, you gotta pay their rent, you gotta give them freaking dental health care and stuff like that. So managing to keep your workforce big enough and bulky enough to finish a game, it's expensive. And during that time, you're getting zero dollars. Like consider the fact that during the course of making a game, it's not like you're getting a monthly fee from headquarters. So uh, basically what he's saying is the fact that PlayStation stepped in and paid them for it to be on PlayStation Plus helped the game get done. But here's the interesting thing. Initially, Lanning was hesitant to give the game away on PlayStation Plus due to the lack of PlayStation 5 consoles. However, the team eventually agreed and Lanning said, we thought we did pretty good deal. The director said that the game did significantly better than the team could have imagined due to the change in release date. Because it slipped to April, we had the highest download game on PlayStation 5, and I think it was approaching something close to 4 million units. All of them for free, and for us, that was devastating. Now this The game wouldn't have fucking existed without Sony's money. You're not really in a place to say that them doing exactly what you fucking agreed to was devastating for the game when it wouldn't have fucking existed without them in the first place. This dude just sounds like a salty motherfucker. He didn't ask for more money. This is interesting. So basically what he's saying is that they're trying to make the decision as to whether or not giving this game away for free or not was a good thing or a bad thing. Four million people playing your game is great, but when you've already been paid for it, that kind of sucks. Like if you're paid before you do the work and then the work ends up being much harder than you expected, it can kind of suck to be like, all right, we got done, but at what cost? Here's a fascinating like alternate viewpoint from this guy called Piers Harding. He's basically like a uh, technical analyst inside the games industry. And he says this, basically, it seems like the game itself may not have even been completed without that PlayStation money. But once it came out, the fact that it got 4 million downloads you can't help but basically see those dollar signs and realize maybe we screwed up now part of the reason this is just so deep and really just technical to try and dissect is the fact that game pa there's not anything technical here he signed a contract he missed his release date as a result he released it at a time where there was more playstation 5 consoles on the market and therefore more people downloaded the game instead of buying it get fucked nerd you signed a contract, deal with the ramifications. Your game wouldn't have been made without the PlayStation money in the first place. Pass and PlayStation Plus, these are a very different beast. For some people it works, for some people it doesn't. The fact that this was a single player experience, one of those one and done games, I feel like the fact that it was free made it where everybody was invested, everybody was fun. I think a lot of people jumped on board for this new Odd World game. But then a lot of people also left. I do feel like because it wasn't a paid experience, it makes it so people probably play the first couple levels and then uninstall it if it doesn't feel like their cup of tea. If It looks boring as shit.
feels like a lot of single player games are more beloved and higher selling on PlayStation in general, but then a lot of times they don't dominate the conversation as long. It feels like their experience This game does not look very good. Experienced, they're loved, they get their profit, and then everybody moves on to the next big single player experience. Whereas the stuff that does find a more permanent home on both Game Pass and PlayStation Plus does seem like the multiplayer stuff. Like right here. I actually was thinking about this. Think about Rocket League. Rocket League came back in July of 2015. It was launched as a... So Smoke Show with the two kind of found that Quantum TV video about you if you haven't seen it. Yeah, I have it. So I appreciate it. But yeah, I got it. Free game on PlayStation Plus. Rocket League got so many tens of millions of downloads that it's still successful today. That game is still making money on tons of platforms. This thing is on Switch, Xbox, PC. You could play it on a Steam Deck, and this thing is still incredibly profitable, and it does- Actually, you can't play it on a Steam Deck because the Fortnite owners bought it. Unlucky. Seemed like, to a big degree, it was that big kick in the butt. The fact that it came out initially on PlayStation Plus, it gave people a chance to try it out, to experience it, and go, oh yeah, remote control car soccer is a great idea. And because of the addictive nature of it, people are still buying skins and spending microtransactions to keep it profitable years after it was free. But then there's also interesting stuff like this. Think about something like Fall Guys. Fall Guys was on the PlayStation Plus. It was the biggest game in the world for a bit, but it fell off very, very hard. Because like Halo Infinite, they never fucking updated it. Fall Guys, definitely, they said directly that they were trying to replicate the success of Rocket League, and they did, but to such a shorter extent. There is this interesting yin and yang, where it does feel like a lot of times games come out, they get that attention, and then they either ex- Yo, how much time did I spend on Fall Guys? I played it like maybe once or twice, I feel like, and then got bored and never touched it again. Let's see. Where the fuck is it? I played it for an hour. Yeah, I was about to say. That was not for me. I played it like once or twice, and I was like, eh, I'm done. Explode or die. It's difficult not to compare stuff like what they're doing with Halo. The fact that Halo Infinite and Halo Master Chief Collection are still getting updates because they are on Xbox Game Pass is fascinating. Now, personally, I'm still very mad at Halo Infinite because they're so slow to drip feed me freaking content, but it's fascinating that Halo Master Chief Collection is still getting new stuff added to it. All the <laughs> and Halo Infinite's not getting shit. It's years after release, and that is definitely because, specifically, the subscription model. Like, I keep thinking about the fact that developed What? MCC does not have a subscription model, bro. Developers seem to be getting paid in a way that they weren't before. Now, I want to talk about this tweet. This is a really old one. This is a tweet from three years ago. Basically, what happened was that a lot of people that are involved in streaming services, stuff like Netflix completely screws over a bunch of independent filmmakers where you'll make a very passionate project with your friends, you set things up, you do things right, and it costs you a couple million dollars to make it. Usually, whenever it comes to releasing it on Netflix, they'll pay you the bare minimum possible. It actually... That is not fucking true at all. That is a complete lie. Netflix does not operate that way. Netflix will pay to have either you produce the film or movie TV show yourself and then Netflix will buy it from you or Netflix will sign a contract with you to produce it and fund it. What the fuck are you talking about? You don't have to sign a deal with Netflix. If you don't like what they're offering, don't fucking sell it to them. Simple as that. Screws people over a lot, basically. No, they don't. It's their fault for signing a contract they don't fucking like after the fact. Same with musicians. If you're a little indie band and you put something on like Spotify or Pandora, a lot of times you're paid fractions of a penny per play, which means... Yeah, no shit. Just like a YouTube video, you're paid fractions of a penny per play. <gasps> it's almost like it's the same fucking model that all of us use on YouTube to make money. Only a musician gets like four times as much on Spotify as we do on YouTube, so poor fucking babies. If you're not the biggest streamer, then you are going to die in the water. So a lot of people seem to assume that right now, with the games industry, 
that Game Pass and PlayStation Plus would kill them too, that this would crush people, when in fact it does feel like, for the most part, developers seem to be happy with these services. PlayStation Plus does still feel like it's in a different position than Xbox Game Pass. It does feel like, from the reports from developers themselves, it does feel like Microsoft is paying a higher upfront fee than PlayStation is. It definitely seems like, from a lot of the reports and stuff, that if you get that Xbox paycheck, it is big, it is fat, and it is very, very profitable. Whereas PlayStation, it does seem as if they're just giving you some of the dev costs. They're covering the fees to get the game finished. Yeah, because they can't fucking afford it. Finished, and then it's sort of just up to you to sell it after that. I think that there is an interesting yin and yang, and I'm going to be curious how many games are actually petitioned to be in PlayStation Plus. Like, consider that. How many people right now are begging to get into PlayStation Plus? How many people are begging to get into PlayStation Now? How many people want that PlayStation paycheck just to finish their dream project? That, to me, is the real conundrum. But what do you think about this? What do you think about Lauren Landing, this dude actually being so pissed about the devastating failure of his game? Tell me your thoughts in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a giant thumbs up, share with your friends, and subscribe if you haven't already. But do me the biggest favor of all, and keep dreaming. This is fascinating. Uh, if you heard that owl, again, sorry, bird meth. It's, it's a problem in Texas, I guess. Thanks so much for watching that video. If you want to see something else, you can always click. Basically, to sum this up, a game developer signed an agreement with Sony to release his game in PlayStation Plus in exchange for funding to finish his game. He got fucking pissed because he delayed the game. It came out later than he expected when there was more PlayStation 5s available, so more people downloaded the game, and somehow he thought that because like more people downloaded it, all of those downloads would have transferred into sales, which is completely fucking false, because I can guarantee you most people would have never fucking bought that game who downloaded it for free. Just saying. Click this link to see what I put up last, or, you know, subscribe and see what's coming up next. Also, I promise that whatever I do, it'll try not to suck. The Dreamcast guy. I love it when you suck. <laughs> I don't fucking know, man. I don't know. It's a shit. Hold on, let me check real quick. Okay, yeah, this is a... Forgot who made it. This one. So Sony and Nintendo are making major changes to PlayStation Plus and Nintendo Switch Online. No more free money for you, boys. But you don't need money anyway. You just want to be paid in corn. But you eat from holes. Corn. Skip it up and that up! Hey everybody, this is Rich of Review Tech USA and my two lovely birds, and today's video is brought to you by ExpressVPN, and let me ask you a question. Do you like logs? Well, guess what? If you don't have ExpressVPN, your ISP is pretty weird service and your internet experience. If that got shut down, that would kind of hurt my livelihood if I click RT3, Petitions and Markets Authority, Microsoft to comply with the UK's Competitions and Markets Authority changed how their subscription services work. When it comes to Xbox Live and Game Pass, Microsoft needs to be more upfront with information to help customers understand their Xbox membership. They need to let subscribers know that auto renewal is active unless it is turned off, the price of the renewal, as well as clear guidance on how to get a refund. Microsoft said they'll also offer refunds to customers on recurring 12-month subscriptions with offers to end their contract, as well as reach out to inactive customers still paying for online services to give them the option to cancel their subscription if the account is still... So basically, they just don't want to be sued. That's it. Inactive after that, Microsoft's just going to cancel the subscription the person has. 
and CMA Director of Enforcement Michael Grinfeld said that other companies should be ready because they're going to come after them too. Keep in mind what's interesting about this, even though CMA is based out of the UK, Microsoft's going to implement these policies worldwide. So it's a pretty big deal what happened there. Well, it seems that due to pressure from the CMA, Sony and Nintendo are going to follow suit as well. This also comes from gamesindustry.biz. I'll have links to articles below in the description if you want to read more into this. Anyway, I'm going to read this to you and then we'll discuss. Now, Sony and Nintendo agreed to update guidelines when it comes to their respective online subscription services following an investigation into auto renewal practices by the Competition and Markets Authority. Sony has agreed to implement new measures for PS Plus subscribers, which includes contacting long-term customers that haven't used the service for a while to remind them how to cancel subscriptions. If users Yeah, this just sounds like we don't want to get sued in a nutshell. Users don't cancel the service but aren't actively using it, Sony will stop taking payments. Hallelujah. Nintendo has also altered its business practices. Its Nintendo Switch Online service will no longer be sold with automatic renewal as the default option, which is nice and shady of them. All companies do this, though, even outside of gaming. If users wish to turn it on, they will need to do so after signing up, which I can understand if you're going to be an active user of the service that you want to have auto renewal on. But let the consumer choose if they want it on. Don't automatically have auto renewal on. And like I said, a lot of companies, even outside of gaming, do the same exact thing. Anyway, this is what the CMA Director of Enforcement, Michael Grinfeld, had to say about the situation when it comes to Nintendo and Sony. As a result of our investigations, a number of changes have been made across this sector to protect customers and help tackle concerns about auto renewing subscriptions. Today's announcement therefore concludes our investigations into the online video game gaming sector, companies and other sectors which offer subscriptions that auto renew should review their practices to ensure they comply with consumer protection law. And I hope they go after other ones because there's a whole bunch of other companies that do the same damn thing. So this, I think, is a good thing. And anybody who is an adult who sign up for any subscription service in the past before, you know what happens. Life gets in the way. You stop using something you were using before. And it's not that you're being irresponsible. It's just like, oh, yeah, I forgot to, you know, stop the auto renewal on that. Oh, yeah, six years. Yeah, I've never had that really happen, to be honest. I just turn off auto renewal, like, immediately after signing up or anything. But I don't know. Years later, I forgot to stop the auto renewal on that. Yeah, it should be the consumer's responsibility. But it's very easy for, as you could see, it's very easy for Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo Oh, wow, this person hasn't used this subscription in six months or 12 months. Let's just stop charging them. We could automatically, hey, at this date, if this person stops using the service for a certain amount of time, we'll stop charging the person. It's very simple to do, but why don't they want to do it? It's the same like if you sign up for an app on your phone and pay monthly. They're hoping that you forget. You know, or, oh, yeah, you get a month free and then we're automatically going to charge you. Why do you think they do that? Because a lot of people forget and it's free money. And I'm sure they make millions upon millions of dollars of from people who aren't using their services. And again, I'm not just talking about Sony, Microsoft and Nintendo. So I want to see this implemented across the board. There's Am I still paying for Crunchyroll? Yeah, but I just don't really care. It's very simple for these companies to say, okay, this person has not used our app. Haven't logged into it in like two years, but yeah, I'm sure it's still probably charging me. Or our service since this date, we're going to stop charging them. And it shouldn't have taken the CMA to step in. But that's why these regulatory companies, when they do their job, need to exist. Yeah, so actually, long as they're not corrupt that. and actually do their job. So I applaud the CMA for doing this. And it's going to save a lot of people a lot of money in the long run. This is Rich of Review Tech USA signing out. Have a good one. Let me see if it's still charging there. Yep, <laughs> still a premium member. Hell yeah, bro. Still getting charged for it. Give me the password. Fuck nah. It's a secret. But yeah, there we go. I logged into it for the first time in years. Hell yeah. So, GG won't play it, right?
10 things that you should be buying at Costco. Oh, my God. Holy shit, dude. Secret Costco pickups. Dude, what is it with people's, like, obsession with fucking Costco? Like, I get, like, it's cool and everything. I go to Costco, but it's, like, bro, motherfuckers really be basing their identity on, like, their fucking trips to Costco and shit like that. It's kind of odd if you ask me. I don't know. I don't really get the, like, dick sucking of Costco, if that makes sense. How many players on Vanguard? I don't know. He can't check. It's not like the old CODs where they actually told you. Unfortunate. Like, you used to be able to uh, highlight whatever game mode you wanted to play on COD, and it would tell you exactly how many people are in that specific uh, playlist. Which was really nice, but yeah, now they got rid of that a long time ago. I'm trying to think, what else should we watch? We got time for like one more video. No, we'll watch Chris Chan maybe tomorrow. I don't know. Can't check Steam. Uh, Call of Duty's not on Steam. You got to play it on this fucking shitty ass thing. The Blizzard launcher. Drake get shot. Dude, I don't give a fuck about that, if I'm being honest. This thing actually, I don't know. I'm kind of tempted to click on this. I don't know. Fuck it. Click so, baby. we've had our hands on a Steam Deck for a while now. Now, we put out a before you buy video, a general overview and our opinions, and we really like the device. Even with all of its first generation quirks, we've been having a blast. And now that it's finally starting to show up a bit more and get into more people's hands, for today's video, we're gonna do a sort of update and what we've actually been doing with the thing since we've had it. We've got some dumb stuff and some serious tests and just some stuff we found ourselves doing the most with it. Some basic stuff, some complicated stuff. So we've got 10 things. Let's get started off with number 10. The first thing we did was upgrade the storage. Now, if you play games, you know how- Fucking crazy, dude. You upgraded the storage? Well, you can upgrade the storage, which is scary. More to it, and test wise, we can only go off of our real world experience. You know, we're not about to drop this thing off of a ledge because they're still not readily available. That's irresponsible. But from using it in the real world, it does stand up to normal abuse fairly well. Like we said in our previous video, the build quality is really good and sturdy plastic. So it doesn't feel too carpet or baby this thing without. Uh, don't be like, just after something in the dirty hand, heightened version of a real world. It does not delicate. This shit the is so fucking cringe, bro. What the fuck is the point of this video? This is why I don't fucking watch normie shit on YouTube. This is why I don't watch YouTube for the most part. Like, most of the shit's just lame as fuck. Steam Deck is goaded, by the way. I put 50 hours on Final Fantasy 15 PC and I'm level 75. Nice, bro. Yeah, I'm gonna get my Steam Deck eventually. I sold my first one. MBG? What is he damage controlling now? Is PlayStation making a big mistake? Oh, God. All right, guys. In today's video, we're going to be having a discussion about Sony's aggressive push into live service gaming. 
<laughs> oh shit. Here we go. This is something that a lot of PlayStation fans have an opinion on because Sony has made it clear that this is something they are pursuing aggressively going forward. And with that, we can expect to see some very different types of games coming from PlayStation Studios and their partners throughout this generation. So not only do I want to discuss this with you, go over some information and give my thoughts on it, but I'm going to be asking you a question and I'm hoping you will answer it in the comment section down below. I'm going to be paying very close attention to the comments on this video. Do you think Sony is making a mistake by pursuing live service games so aggressively? I know. No, they want to make fucking money. That's all that matters to them at the end of the day. So doom boom with the two, I show Costco because I have a restaurant business. Yeah, I know people like for, well, I mean, it's not like the restaurant business, but I know a lot of people get into the fucking vending machine business and will buy all their cans and bottles and shit at Costco. So I guess that makes sense. Yeah. You get cheap ass like food products and everything. Buying in bulk is cheaper. So. I know that people have a. In Pot and Investor with the 13 months of tier two, can we watch Modern Warfare 2 gun animation? It's a short. It's not real, but the same guy that made it's working on the animation. Uh, let me get the popcorn. He's going to be upset. Like, they're mad that they're not getting fucking walking simulators anymore. Seven inches? That's pretty I big. Remap that button. I think it's busted. That one's like sticky. A strong opinion on this and many of you are going to say yes absolutely many of you are going to say no it's fine but i think just as many are going to kind of be in the middle where they can see the pros and the cons they can see how this can be a good thing but there are also some potentially very big pitfalls that sony may end up falling into and so yeah i'll be interested to see what you guys like making their racing game pay to fucking win you guys have to say uh before we get into it Make sure you hit the like button to help the video out. And if you are new to the channel, hit that subscribe button as well. But I'm starting here by pointing out recent news. I'm sure many of you heard about this, but in case you missed it, Sony officially confirmed that they have 10 live service games in development. And what's even more interesting than that is they are telling their investors and their shareholders that they are planning to release up to 10 live service games by 20. 26. That is definitely significant because what that means is that a lot of these games are likely far along in development and many of them are going to be revealed soon and they will be releasing sooner rather than later. Now, this immediately caused a lot of concern with PlayStation fans because when you think about what has made PlayStation a dominant force and what has allowed them to not only find the success that they have today but also kind of stand out is their single player games sony is known to deliver some incredible triple a cinematic single player this game looks i'm sorry days gone looks incredibly fucking boring games that a lot of other publishers try to do but don't do as well but many other publishers just like don't this gameplay literally looks like the most generic fucking third person shooting in existence like, this looks like one of those really shitty third-person shooters that would have come out in, like, the 360 era. Don't even try at all, and they have seemingly given up on single-player, although I think it's getting better. Like, it almost looks like State of Decay, just with, like, better graphics. Better, but the point is, this is what Sony has done really, really well. This is what they've done best, you could say. And, you know, PlayStation fans and gamers alike are concerned that by Sony pursuing... 10 live service games within such a short period of time that it's going to come at the expense of single player games now i'm gonna say all i'm gonna say is if their games start playing more like destiny versus what they're currently making i would actually be more interested in them so shushi with d2 why does this video look poorly edited because he's using fucking dog shit stock footage from like playstation trailers that's a right now i do not he doesn't actually use his own gameplay footage envision a future no matter how successful some of these live service games could end up being for sony where they decide to stop making single player games i just don't think that will ever be a thing playstation is aware that single player games is at the heart of the brand and the core following eh, not really 
the heart of the brand is Call of Duty, Fortnite, Minecraft, that type of shit. That's what's selling consoles, not this crap. That PlayStation has the fan base, the players. Most of them do play these single player games and do expect them. No, they don't. Most people on PlayStation do not play these single player games. Completely fucking false. To be there. So Sony's not going to do something that's going to, you know, make that core fan base be like, you know what? I don't want to play on PlayStation anymore because they're not making single player games. It's just not going to happen no matter how successful some of their live service games are. That's my opinion. But yeah, no. If they're making billions of dollars on live service games, they're going to ditch single player in a fucking heartbeat. But when I look at PlayStation Studios and the way that they've been growing in the past couple years, I think it does reveal some interesting things. The first thing it reveals, obviously, is that Sony is trying to scale up in a very significant way. We obviously immediately pay attention to the recent acquisitions such as Bungie, Haven Studio, Bluepoint, How Who the fuck is Haven Studio? Smart, so on and so forth, and you know, Fire Sprite. There will be more acquisitions. Three of those don't even make fucking their own games. Blue Point remasters other people's games. They've never actually made a game themselves. Haven Studios. I'm pretty sure that's the studio that hasn't even put out a single game in its history. Fire Sprite. No one's fucking heard of that shit. Bungie. I'll give them that. That's PlayStation's official best developer. Um, and then I don't remember the other one he said. There's oh, Housemark, the one that made shitty fucking indie games like Super Stardust and then made Returnal. A $70 game that could barely sell 300,000 copies. But yeah, PlayStation is expanding rapidly. No doubt about that. But something else that I think a lot of people are not aware of is that while Sony is also out there acquiring studios and trying to bring on new talent and new teams... They are also doubling and tripling down on the teams that they currently own and that have been a part of PlayStation Studios for a long time. Studios such as Naughty Dog, Sucker Punch, Santa Monica, London Studio, Guerrilla Games, and the list kind of goes on here. These studios are having a lot of money put into them so that way they can essentially create two or three separate development teams. And so this way, We'll use Guerrilla Games as an example. While Guerrilla Games was working on Horizon Forbidden West, a massive AAA open world single player narrative driven game, they also have a second AAA team that they essentially built. They created this team back in, I believe, 2017, 2018, and they started work on a new AAA multiplayer project, which is no doubt going to be one of these live service games. And I think that when you look at that and you see that, it is actual proof that okay well that game's development had essentially no impact on horizon forbidden west and by that i mean it didn't get in the way it didn't take away from it and i think we're going to see very similar things with many of sony studios we are seeing that with naughty dog for example naughty dog puts out a game like the last of us part two it is a very high production value very high quality triple a single player game but that just happens to be incredibly fucking boring and arduous to get through. And about halfway through the game, you're like, why the fuck is this not over yet? But yeah, great game, right? Minimal while with D2, they should put Ghost of Tsushima on Steam. Yeah, they are. It was in the Steam link, or the NVIDIA leak, I'm pretty sure. The next project that they're going to be revealing is a standalone multiplayer Last of Us game that is obvious. Yeah, because they want to charge you for um two games instead of one. You know, they strip the multiplayer out of The Last of Us 2 and then sell it separately. But, you know, Sony, hashtag for the players, am I right? Obviously going to be a service game. I don't think anybody is anticipating that once Naughty Dog puts this game out, that's it. They're done working on single player games. We should not expect any more single player titles from Naughty Dog. Absolutely. I mean, what else is Naughty Dog working on other than this multiplayer game, though? So... Maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. It's not going to work that way. They are currently working on another single player game. Who knows? Really? They are? Do you work there? What that game is, but there's no doubt. Who knows what that game is? Exactly. Nobody fucking does. So how can you say with 
strange certainty that they are actually working on this single player game, but you know, whatever. Out that we're gonna get that after this Last of Us multiplayer game. And I think that this is the approach that Sony is taking with not every one of their first party studios, but quite a few of them like Sucker Punch. You look at how they handled Ghost of Tsushima Legends and Insomniac Games, they're working on two AAA single- Yeah, Ghost of Tsushima Legends didn't take off though. It was more of just kind of like, oh, here's a multiplayer mode. It wasn't like a huge success. Player games, that being Spider-Man 2, as well as Wolverine, but they're also working on a third title, which is a multiplayer game. And you would assume that it's going to be one of these live service titles that Sony is referring to. And I have to imagine that there are quite a few other projects that are in development behind the scenes between PlayStation Studios and their partners that we don't yet know about that will be single player, that won't actually be multiplayer. Or maybe they'll be single player, but they'll have like a co-op portion. And I don't necessarily think it's gonna be like a service game. This is kind of what I'm anticipating. It's also worth noting that, as I said, as Sony continues to scale up their uh, studios, they are partnering with others such as Deviation Games and Firewalk. These are studios that have not really been known for anything, really. They're not. <laughs> <laughs> but let's get hype, boys. Known to make single player games, but they have a lot of veteran talent who worked on games like Call of Duty, Destiny, Halo, Titanfall, things like this, where they're making these types of games and they're starting their game as a live service from this yeah there's a lot of people who used to work on call of duty halo destiny whatever that have tried to make their own games all of them have been massive fucking failures start and sony kind of wants to try to bring them on board in case one of them does end up producing something really great maybe you know the next big hit live service game sony wants to be part of that if they're able to and god look how shit killzone shadowfall looks like that frame rate is god awful and i think that that is a better approach than attempting to mandate that every single one of your studios starts putting all of their resources I forgot how shit this game was all of their you know talent on making live service games that would be pretty terrible i think we can all agree like this game was so bad that there was a class action lawsuit about it like killzone shadowfall is probably one of the worst first person shooters to ever release with that now there's another aspect to this that we do need to talk about with sony pursuing so many live service games how exactly are they going to handle monetization i think that this is one of the biggest concerns that people have when it comes to sony pursuing live service games like this and i think it's absolutely a fair concern because not only have we seen other publishers shit? mess this up badly but we just saw sony kind of mess it up themselves right out of the gate with gt7 where people were not happy and they had to suddenly adjust things and listen to the community because they thought that what they had set up was fine and there were no issues but clearly no 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 what they set up originally wasn't greedy enough for them so they had to make it even fucking worse no quit trying to paint sony like oh you know they they just tried to make the best game they could no they made the game already pay to fucking win then they found out, oh wait, people aren't paying us enough money, so we're going to make it even more fucking pay to win. And it was only after that that they finally got enough backlash to where they had to revert it to the point where people still weren't happy about it, but they weren't as mad about it. So no, Sony can fucking kick rocks, dude. That was not the case with the player base, and it just wasn't a good first impression with GT7 being a live service game. And then their second impression was even fucking worse. So now, obviously, more people are concerned that, well, I guess this is how it's going to be with many of their games. And it could be. I will say the most... Dude, this game looks like fucking shit. What is this? The concerning thing here is that GT7 is being sold as a $70 game that does also offer quite a few microtransactions. And Sony was seeing... Yeah, pay-to-win microtransactions. Not just microtransactions, literal fucking pay to win. Seemingly trying to kind of nudge people in that direction. Like they obviously want you to buy the microtransactions on top of having already paid full price for the game. Now, I don't know what Sony's plans are for their other games. For example, like The Last of Us multiplayer. I think it would be very wise of Sony if they're focused on microtransactions and recurring revenue in that way having that recurrent revenue stream, they should focus on making as many of these games 
free to play as they possibly can because it is absolutely not going to be a good look if Sony comes out or just don't make them pay to win. It's really not that hard here and says, here's our last of us online game, pay us 70 bucks and you can expect to see just a flood of microtransactions. And even if they don't have any effect over the gameplay, Bro, what the fuck was that? Still, I don't think it's going to be a good look, but more importantly, I don't think that that's how you create a successful live service game that is i guess you could say one of the most played games in the world the only way sony's going to be able to do that in my opinion is by making many of these games free to play now whether or not they're going to do that remains to be seen we will find out when they announce these games but you generation with the two it's a racing game oh thank you for the clarification man i see that now thank you yeah, this is kind of where we stand. Sony is in this position where they have seemingly followed a formula with single player narrative driven AAA games that has worked for them and they're not going to stop that anytime soon. In fact, I don't, as I said, I don't think they're going to stop it ever. And that's continuing to work really well for them. But they see a big growth area in live service games. In fact, Sony is so confident in live service games being the future of what do you mean a growth area live service games are like the biggest games in the world already like it's like saying welcome to the 21st century growth within their brand and within gaming that jim ryan recently said in an interview with gamesindustry.biz that he doesn't believe a game pass like netflix like model is where their future success lies he believes that live service games such as what we see with titles like Fortnite, GTA Online, etc. You know, these games have proven that, look, these games are almost looked at as subscription services in themselves. And I do completely understand that. And I know that a lot of people get concerned when they hear games like GTA Online and Fortnite. But one thing that you do have to understand is that there is a reason why these games are so successful. There is a reason why millions upon millions of players are still there every day, every week, every month, engaged with this game, and why these games also have- Yeah, dude, facts. Donda is better than um, Certified Boy Lover, 100%. Happen to make the most money. It's because even though these games may not be for me, or they may not be for you, and they may not be something that you engage with, they are good games. Good enough to where people, as I said, like to continue to exist in those worlds, go- Good enough for the majority of people buying a fucking console in the first place to literally play those primarily. Yeah, bro, DJ Academics fell asleep listening to CLB right after going like, what? My top five is Drake, 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 Drake. Then he passed the fuck out on stream listening to that shit. God damn. Go back to them. And that was a fun night, though. That shit was funny as fuck play them and you really can't fault sony or i think any other game publisher for wanting to also achieve that right i mean to me the idea of a last of us online game like what we're about to get from naughty dog where it's a persistent world they're constantly uh, changing it and evolving it and there's always something new to look forward to and you get that amazing gameplay that was there in the last of us part two you get to create your own character you get to go on missions you get to just go out there in some type of maybe open world and explore and then maybe they also have some pvp competitive aspects that sounds awesome to me like a a way i can always kind of interact with that world of the last of us and then you know i get to look forward to whatever single player titles that naughty dog or any of their other studios want to put out um alongside that and i think that this is where sony can find that uh, good balance and as somebody who is a fan of both single player and multiplayer gaming i am genuinely rooting for sony to succeed here and do it right as long oh, really he's rooting for sony shock as long as they can keep pumping out great single player content and games and as long as they are mindful and thoughtful about the way they're going to handle monetization and they do it right way they make it fair they make it balanced i think this could be a great thing and one last thing i do want to say here before i end this discussion video is for anybody who maybe thinks that sony is getting away from their roots or something like that by doing this they're actually not i want to remind people that sony had a pretty significant multiplayer presence during the playstation 3 days or even no they did not back with the playstation 2 with some games like socom but definitely socom
Bruh. That shit fucking sucked. During the PlayStation 3 era, they were trying to find some pretty significant success with multiplayer games, and unfortunately, they completely fucking failed at every single turn. What did they have? Warhawk? Trash. Mag? Trash. DC Universe Online or whatever? Trash. What else did they have? Fuck, I forgot. I think they had H1Z1 or whatever the fuck. But after they got rid of it is when it actually became popular. They had Planet Side Trash. Um, What else did Sony have? I played all these fucking games on the PS3. <laughs> I'm trying to think what else. It was trash, bro. Like Sony's PS3 multiplayer games were some of the worst in the video game industry. Nothing really caught on for Sony in the way that they had hoped with games like Killzone and Warhawk and many others. And so I think it actually makes sense that now that they've established kind of a new footing here with single player games, they're going to try this again. And I think now in 2022, it makes more sense than ever before for Sony to do something like this. So yeah, that's pretty much going to do it for the video, guys. As I said, I want you to leave your thoughts down below and answer that question. Do you think this is a mistake or do you think that... Oh, yeah, dude. PlayStation Home. Oh, my God. We don't have party chat, but we have PlayStation fucking Home. This is actually going to be a good thing for PlayStation in the long run. Be sure to leave it a like if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you're new. Hit the bell notification icon and feel free to share the video out on top of all that. But until next time, guys, take care. Press X podcast. <laughs> More like press X to fucking doubt podcast. Jesus Christ, bro. PS Home was like some fucking really cringy, almost like VR chat like thing that Sony had on the PS3 because they literally had zero fucking social features on that console. Like the only thing you could do was actually send messages to your friend. Like, you couldn't even join a fucking party outside of, like, a video game lobby. So they came up with this idea for, like, basically a combination of the Nintendo Wii Miis and, like, VR chat, kind of. That's what it was. It was, like, this thing called PS Home. You would go in it and walk around, like, a digital space and you could talk to people. It was their solution for not having fucking party chat. And it sucked, bro. Absolutely fucking sucked. Nobody used it. I don't know. But I'm probably going to go ahead and hop off for tonight, guys. I need to go to sleep. It's almost 3. So, I'll probably go live tomorrow. Maybe we can watch... I think we'll probably... Yeah, we'll go ahead and watch the fucking uh, Chris Chan shit. So we'll watch that tomorrow night. But anyway, guys, hope you all have a good Thursday and I will talk to y'all later. Peace out. Have a good one, guys.